right. Hello, everybody. It's me, Will Miniker. It's your chopper for the week. Uh, sitting in today, we got Matt and Amber. Matt, Howdy. Hi. Amber, how's it going? It's going well. So, um, it's sort of, a, I guess, a slow news weekend, unless you're, you know, interested in uh, Donald Trump going to prison. Yeah. And uh, all the people, you know, lying, lying, and uh, failing. But it, it certainly was. It's been make for some great SNL. I'll say that for sure. Man, every time something happens, one of these losers gets indicted or pleads guilty. I'm just thinking, oh, man, they're going to go to town. Well, you've mentioned this before, Matt, but you watch every single yes, episode I do. of SNL. I do. I, I, some sort of. This is like a this is like a Maria Abramovich like performance yeah. art thing for you. Uh, this is like the artist is present. You're doing this bizarre feat a, of endure of public in, not even see, public. It's not public. private he's, he's endurance. Exactly. Self loathing completist. No, that, it's a flagellation. It's I'm sorry, never at this point. It's never been about public anything. I will tell people when they're all like, "Who watches Saturday Night Live?" I will opine. I do every episode, but I did that long before anyone cared. Uh, and I will continue. And I, it's just, I need to Why? know what they're doing. Why? I need like to know a, what they're like doing. A, but like, he's I, like a monk for crap. <laughs> but like, here's the thing. I know what they're doing because I wake up like the next day and I just like, the Twitter will be like, you know, Saturday night, Alec Baldwin, uh, we really, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, See, that doesn't or like rapping Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> they do Remember do that? that? They did rapping uh, Ruth Bader. Don't tell me. I, I actually watched <laughs> but it. it like, but I know what they're doing. No, Why you don't. Need to see it? This is why. Because... For what? Yeah, the next day there's gonna be there's gonna be some article about oh they didn't about whatever the political uh, call thing was, but there's a whole ninety minutes. It's like an hour of sketches basically, or forty minutes sketches realistically, and it's just peaks and valleys and different types. And there's there's the com commercial parodies and there's the long uh, opening sketches with the high and the high concept ones and the character bits. And I just need we to know, know what, what the they're show doing. Is. Exactly. But it's, it's a tapestry. Yeah. And if you're I'm saying, with the I'm saying if you're just like, oh, the, what, they're, I know what they're doing. You don't unless you're actually paying attention to it, which I do. Why? And, but well, like, how do you know? I mean, obviously, like you experience it on a visceral level, but like I'm intellectually aware of what they're doing. I need to know. But you need to imbibe it fully. I need to absorb it. And that is why. Because here's the thing. Everyone says, wow, it's so bad. And. Then people say, oh, people are always saying that. That's the, that's the sure. deal. And, and it's just lazy. All the talk about it is lazy from people who don't really watch it that often. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. So you Sorry. want when you complain about Saturday Night Live, you want like the actual cred. Exactly. Because you don't want I, when these rubberneckers who I are passing say, by on Twitter Sunday morning or whatever. Exactly. Because people could say this is so terrible. But I could say with full confidence in my heart knowledge. That the political, specifically the political sketches, the Trump era political sketches, is the worst content they have ever done, like on a consistent basis. The worst kind of sketch they've, including things like Mango or or, or uh, the fuck, basically every Chris Kattan character who until now was like the lowest was possible of... nader, just awful, cringe-inducing, <laughs> yeah. just idiocy. But this is just you don't like the Night at the Roxbury guys. Oh god, no. that was the better one because well, it was half I, Will, but Ferrell. That's all Will Ferrell. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, that was to tolerable because otherwise you're talking about Mango well, you don't like or Mango? Mr. Peepers. Just drag. Oh, wait, wait, what was the difference between Mango and Mr. Peepers? Mango was there the... wasn't much. Mango was gayer. <laughs> no, Mr. Mango Peepers was was like a monkey. It was yeah, a monkey man. Mr. Peepers yeah. was who ate, a... the, ate apples really yeah. fast yeah, and yeah. spit it that up. That was the one bit. And yeah. Mango, the joke of Mango is that straight men wanted to have sex with. Oh, him. I remember Garth. Uh, Garth, Garth Brooks, Brooks was yeah. like, yeah. "Mango, please yeah. come yeah. back." And, I love like, you. and he said his classic catchphrase: "You can't have the mango." And then would smack his ass. Yes. So I could, that, that oh, was man. brutally terrible. Oh, man. Also, but, it should not surprise you that Chris Kattan uh, later turned out to be like a really gross guy regarding women and made some really disgusting comments about women later. Because when you play a character like that, for or both of those characters, your only recourse is to become like, like an MRA kind of guy. Well, it's amazing. The, the track record of, of mid-tier SNL guys who never became super famous becoming bitter reactionaries is Oh, un yeah. wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's unprecedented. Rob Schneider, Rob Dennis Schneider. Miller. Miller. Yeah. Love it. But, yeah. but back to current day, yeah. like last week's SNL. Yeah. It, it, like, it's not so much that like, like people come, like, I can't believe how stupid this is. 
you are sitting there. I assume not like you're not watching it live, right? Usually that would be, no. That would be usually not, but sometimes well, you I do. Well, I mean, if just, I'm home and I'm not doing anything that's on, I'm going to watch it. If I'm not doing anything else and it's Saturday night, I'm going to watch it. But I'm not going to go. <laughs> I'm not going to cancel. Me, Matt. Yeah, I'm not going to cancel plans Matt, to see it. there are it. better things to do I with your Saturday night. All of, these, all of these other people who are just being like, oh, Saturday Night Live sucks. You're like, no, fuck you. You were sitting there looking at like Colin Jost's like smirking face and you're just like, <laughs> Let the old flesh die. Well, the new flesh will replace. We, we will live yeah. in the new flesh yes. now. You're just like letting yourself just rot away, like, you know, yeah. just rot away and be yeah. replaced in, 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 you know, a sort of post singularity. Okay, humanity. but I still don't understand why. Is this just to justify your hate? I think it's because I want to know what, what the normies are thinking. I want, because the thing is, people are like, who watches this? But it does pretty well, ratings wise. And it's actually. It's like the Daily Show with Trevor Noah. It's they it's, went uh, up it's for best the first ever, time. It's best best ever ratings yeah, with him. Yeah, People yeah. are watching this stuff, and I want to know. And it is really terrible. It starts with the bad Alec Baldwin impression, uh, and then all the jokes are just, oh, these guys are all crooks and they're going to jail, uh, and that's it. And also, Trump's dumb, but just. Robert De Niro plays Robert Mueller, and quite he's frequently. awful every time. He's one of the worst people who's ever been on SNL. But what makes it interesting is that you could see exactly why it's bad, why it's so bad, because the entire comedic point of view for the political stuff in all of SNL from the beginning is just, we, we're not going to have an actual political valence to any of this. We don't have, we're not going to be doing real satire. All we really do is just take what's already latently absurd about this political figure and then just push it up a notch, basically embodied by... Dana Carvey's impression of George H.W. Bush. That's the whole idea. It's like, instead of going, not going to do it, you go, nah, I got that. That's it. That's the comedy. <laughs> Trump's president. Well, you can't do that. Unless you're going all the way, like we've talked about, where you have him wearing a diaper, and he's saying, goo goo gaga, I poop myself, which would be amazing. If all you're doing is just making him slightly more absurd, you can't do it, because he's already maxed out the This dial. goes back to an old hobby horse of ours on this show that we need mad TV to come back to like li have the yeah. satire for the moment we live in. Yes. Would you say Robert De Niro as Robert Mueller or Robert De Niro in any of his SNL performances of late, would you say he bombed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but man, I, I've noticed that, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you share your granular and very detailed distaste for Saturday Night Live on the timeline. And you said that like, you know, this current iteration the political sketches they do, the Trump ones are the worst thing they've ever, ever done on the show. Mm -hmm. And I saw like, you know, some, I guess, I don't know, some Democrat or like resistance people get pissy with you. Cause yeah, like, it got you're like, you're like, Twitter they, they were like, they were like you know, like just, oh, wow. Like, you know, like the one thing that's like standing up to Donald Trump and you're like, do you realize that he, they literally had him Adam host Adam the show Adam when he was show. running for president? <laughs> I know. It's and amazing. This, like, they, you know, like that, you know, like, massively humanizing him yeah. or like making it seem like he could take a joke which he can't because just yesterday he literally said the feds should investigate Saturday Night Live <laughs> he said collu he literally said all the TV shows being mean to him are collusion yes they're colluding and that the feds should investigate yes. SNL for their jokes which is the most darkly horrific thing we could have is, is toothless awful comedy like that getting a patina of subversiveness from the literal president, calling it that. I mean, how could these guys walk around thinking, wow, maybe we're frauds making garbage because the president is calling for their, he's doing a fatwa yeah. on them. I'm, I'm uh, speaking truth to power. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I am uh, making the comfortable uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm freaking Salman yeah. Rushdie over it's here. Got, I mean, it is the worst of both worlds because the people who think that like the, the daring, cutting edge, subver the, you know, the subversive comedy of SNL is being given uh, credence to by the president being like literally the Department of Justice needs to shut down Saturday <laughs> Night Live for all of their dangerous sketches. Yeah. Where like, you know, it's implied that I'm a know-nothing, uh, half-smart crook or whatever. I don't know. If they put Colin Jost in a black site, I might have to vote for Trump in 2020. I'm not going to lie. Which one is he? Is he the one with He's the, the weekend update the blank-faced, smirking, college boy... Uh, head writer and Weekend Update host, the guy who said in a few episodes back that New York won the lottery by getting the Amazon headquarters and everyone should stop whining oh, about it. Oh, yeah. And they did a sketch about how Jeff Bezos bought... It was the most... This one like made me think, what are they taking in that fucking writer's room to even see the world through? Are they all on ayahuasca? 
Because if I thought, oh if I god, t- they're on stuff that we yeah, have never research, even heard Chinese of Chinese research chemicals or something. Because their take on the Amazon, this is the Steve Carell. Oh, episode. the one with the jaw. Yeah, I don't they, like him or his jaw. Uh, the, the, in the Steve Carell episode, they had a sketch where it was Steve Carell as Jeff Bezos talking about how I I built my headquarters in New York and in, in, in Washington and in, in Queens. And their take on it is that well, that's where Bush where Trump was born and where he lives now. He doesn't so, live in Queens now. No, he, no, he lives in D.C. Okay. now, but he was born in Queens. Oh, yeah. So that's an own of oh. Trump. That's why they picked him to go there. And, of course, they had a line there is like, and I'm actually a billionaire. Ugh. And I was like, I could sit for a year trying to think of an angle about the 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 I would Amazon never, and think, yeah, yeah never they're owning Trump. Yeah. They're owning Trump by putting it in his in his uh, in his hometown and in DC. They're owning. It. When you hear people, you know, folding dollar bills to make it look like the towers are flaming, <laughs> and you're like, oh, how'd you end up there? Well, it's less it, embarrassing than that. Oh, absolutely. It's less. Im- at least those look like flaming towers. Yeah, because yeah, you know, that shit looks like the fucking burning <laughs> twin towers. Yeah. No, that that's and this is another reason to watch SNL. No, well, there's no, no. I don't no. recommend anyone else do it. I will be the scene no, eater for all for of you. Yeah, don't worry about yeah. it. I will. I will be the interpreter. Is that it? It shows you the degree to which the powerlessness people feel, and just the way that they're riveted to this thing that's a pure spectacle in their eyes, uh, is turned them all into like medieval peasants, and they're looking at uh, fish guts and fucking birds flying doing in the augury. sky. Yeah. They're doing augury to try to figure out what's going on in the world because they feel completely uh, uh, helpless. And just like they're at the mercy of this this uh, news cycle. I mean, that's why they had that sketch a few weeks ago where all the women of the SNL cast, cast sang a Christmas carol to Robert Mueller asking what? him to please give them the report so that they can feel normal again and get all this over with because they're just crazy from the news. Okay. What? Yeah. Okay, you've convinced me. Like, what? Yeah. This is your... Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so all the women of SNL yes. and by extension the women of America yeah. are begging this like ancient like fucking Herman Munster looking fed yeah. to restore like their dignity there was a as women painting of him above their head when they were singing it. Yo, the Krasensteins could never. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay, Matt, you convinced me. This is the passion of the Matt this is like your stations of the cross. You're doing this every week. Yeah. Like, you know, for all like, our sinners who couldn't like, do it. You like know? Jesus yeah, being yeah. flayed yeah. and having yeah. the crown of thorns on his head, being led to Golgotha. Yep. And then every Saturday night when it's over and you've seen all of it, you're just like, it is accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> it is accomplished. You know, I wouldn't say that always, but in the last, this season and specifically the last two or three or four episodes, have been so wire to wire bad. Not not even the weird last sketch that sometimes is funny just because they're basically they don't care. They're anymore. tired and they're tired. They figure yeah. they're always watching anyway. That's where sometimes there'd be really funny weird sketches like uh, Robo Chomo from, with uh, yeah. with the Rock, which is in my opinion an all time great uh, great sketch. And that was great. only a couple seasons ago, but uh, e- even now garbage. The last episode, the last sketch of this last episode, uh, the one with Matt Damon, was it was. <laughs> Oh, God. It was Brexit Christmas. Okay. And it was a Christmas special hosted by Theresa May. She comes out. She sings a song. She's got dancing bobbies behind her. And the joke is just, wow, everyone sure hates me because of because uh, of Brexit. They're really mad about Brexit. <laughs> yeah, that's Brexit. why. That, Jesus. It's like, wow, everyone's real mad about this. And some and the, the, the last joke of the entire episode is, First, she has David Cameron on, played by Matt Damon, and he just goes, wow, everyone hates you. And she's like, oh, you jerk. You did everyone Brexit. hates David Cameron, too. Right, but, but he yeah. says, they hate me, and they hate you more, even though I did Brexit. And then she's like, oh. And then, then that last next guest is a guy dressed like Voldemort. No. And, yes. And he comes out, and he goes, and she's like, oh, wow, people hate us really a lot. And he goes, you know what? I really can't be associated with you. And then that's just the sketch. That's the end of the sketch and the episode. Voldemort. Voldemort. Mm-hmm. There's like nothing okay. anymore. Sketches yeah. have even, they don't <laughs> yeah. even have premises. I've changed my mind. You, what you're, you are Matt Christ man. <laughs> yeah, Matt Christ man. You are, Not you only are... that, this is like the last temptation of Matt because I, I imagine now as you're watching the uh, Brexit Voldemort Theresa May sketch, yeah. uh, actually like what happens is you begin to um, receive a vision 
of coming down, of, of stopping watching SNL <laughs> and living life as a man watching a funny yeah. sketch comedy show, yeah. like just watching, I don't know, reruns of uh, Brass Eye or yeah. you know, something like that. Uh, or you know, even the kids in the hall, or something. Oh God, yeah, classic. or Mr. Show, anything, or, or SNLs from like the Farrell <laughs> McKay era when they had yeah. good sketches sometimes. So like, yeah, you received a vision of that of of what it would be like to live as a man <laughs> and Can't not, you know, take on this pain for the rest of humanity. But no, like God, you know, God shows you that vision. Yep. To make to, to underscore how great the sacrifice yeah. you're making is, we'll be praying for you. Yeah, pray for Matt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get a little respite now because there won't be another one until I think mid January. So <laughs> I, get to, I get to take a break. So uh, moving on, um, if y'all thought I was going to be done dancing on the grave of the Weekly Standard, you uh, don't know Will Medicare show, if you thought that. Yeah, he got new dancing shoes. I mean, Will and I spent the the Bush years just as like war boys trying to destroy the caravan of <laughs> shiny and Stand- chrome, just trying to blow the wheels off of the Weekly Standard mobile while yeah. the war wagon. Yeah, as I tried to like just uh, drive my dune buggy under the wheels <laughs> of uh, you know Fred Barnes's yeah. uh, you know suburban uh, caravan. Yeah, uh, headed fucking- to Baghdad, yeah, just trying yeah. to get under the spokes. Witness me. Witness me. And uh, it's finally dead. Yeah. It's finally dead hilariously because the uh, their billionaire sugar daddies, first Rupert Murdoch and now Phil Anschultz, is just like, th- there's no fucking angle yeah. to be What's played in being this? an anti-Trump conservative anymore. Yeah. Like, who are we playing to? All of these, all this respectable opinion we thought had to come along with our conservative uh, retrograde shit. We don't need it anymore. And uh, I want to sup and imbibe deeply of this um, uh, glee over the misfortune of others by just checking in on uh, uh, David Brooks, who wrote a whole column about it this week, called Who Killed the Weekly Standard? In my opinion, a better title and topic for an article would be All the People the Weekly Standard Killed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Of which you're talking millions. Yeah, I'd like to see that issue, just the names. And once again, I mean, I, I know I'm I know I'm repeating myself here, but I've seen even more of it this week because there was some hope that they would get a reprieve or another investor. Now it's all fully dead. Yeah, and they I, fucking shut the doors. They, they yeah, they they <laughs> kicked them all out, gave them the fucking put their desks uh, in a box and kicked them out the door. They cut them off, yeah. basically. It's Phones. like you've been living in the boathouse too long. <laughs> yeah. I'm going I'm to get to some of like the more ironic reactions of them in particular being like, how could you do this to, to working journalists and writers, which is hilarious. But uh, I've seen so many reactions from like liberals be like mm. responding to Bill Kristol, who'd been like, you know, all good things must come to an M working for the Weekly Standard. One of the proudest achievements of my life, blah, blah, blah. And I saw so many responses from like liberals being like, you know, I may not agree with, you know, everything that you say, but like. I just think it's a shame that we don't have an outlet for sane conservative voices. <laughs> These people started the New York Times. Not, not just started the Iraq War; they dreamt it up before it was even a thing. Yeah, and before nine eleven, they were trying to start raise tensions with China because they thought that that would be the twenty first century. Yeah, they were. All, they were like, "Oh, this, 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 this post Cold War doldrum. This isn't going to work. We need a justification for the, the people for the who military. literally conflict. Yeah, through at, through their own." fantasies that they had been like kept close to them since the Reagan and Ford administrations helped start the Iraq war and the war on terror and everything that's come after that. If that isn't insane to you, I know conservatives seem batty now because you know, like they're saying dumber things, but like what could actually be more insane than starting the war in Iraq and actually doing it? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that's the reason that a lot of these guys think Trump is a dangerous maniac is because one of the crazy things he believes is that the Iraq war was a bad idea. At least now he's full of shit. But at the time he thought it was a good idea, but he retroactively decided it was a bad idea. And that's when they all realized we have to stop this guy. And then when they couldn't, they're like, well, we're going to just complain about him in our fucking uh, dork ass newsletter that we send to each other's house. But I it's just <laughs> they're going to continue it. But it's just going to be like tin cans on string, <laughs> like spread throughout Virginia. I mean, by the end of it, it was basically just the, the, the Rod and Todd's newspaper. that they just <laughs> slip under each other's door in the Upper West Side and in northern Virginia. I want to I want to look at this David Brooks piece. because I think it is very indicative of 
their their mindset, their now wounded mindset about this. That like they think that like humanity owes them this journal of excellence and thought yeah. and mm-hmm. intellectual thought. Because some things are more important. Exactly. <laughs> so he, uh, David Brooks writes here, I've only been around Phil and Schultz. And Schultz. Phil and Schultz. Phil Anschluss. Phil, Phil Anschluss. <laughs> <laughs> a few times. My impressions on those occasions was that he was a run-of-the-mill arrogant billionaire. What, as opposed to the other kinds that you've right. met, Visionary David? geniuses? Yeah. You mean the people you think should have total control of society, you fucking dork? He was used, uh, he was, he was used to people courting him, and he addressed them condescendingly from the lofty height of his own wealth. Again, as opposed to David Brooks, who like literally every one of his columns is addressing his readers condescendingly from a lofty perch of the New York Times. Yes. A job he got, by the way, after making a name for himself at the Weekly Standard. Writing insane gibberish. I've never met Ryan McKibben, who runs part of Ann An Schultz's... Uh, An- An- <laughs> Anschluss. An- That's what we're going Schluss. with now. Yeah. Yeah. Philip Anschluss, Anschluss Media Group. But stories about him have circulated around Washington over the years. The story suggested that he is an ordinary corporate bureaucrat with all the petty vanities and lack of interest in ideas that go with the type. Again, just keep this in mind because it's going to get it's going to be relevant. This This is a messy bit. This week, they (laughs) murdered the Weekly Standard. (laughs) Murdered. They they dropped they dropped a laser guided bomb on the Weekly Standard. They 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 murdered murdered, it with depleted uranium. They they murdered the Weekly Standard so badly that the, the, our, their children will be born with deformities <laughs> for generations to come. God, I hate no, it. I, I hate mean, it a better they... metaphor would actually be uh, last week, the Weekly Standard succumbed to a long battle with prostate cancer. <laughs> <laughs> um, the conservative opinion magazine that Ann Schultz owned, they didn't merely close it because it was losing money. Of course it was. They never never made money once. Uh, they seem to have murdered it out of greed and vengeance. Again, <laughs> murdered it out of greed and vengeance. Uh, yeah, th- this is the one kind of bad billionaire that yeah. does that yeah. mm-hmm. when, to when a they, media company. When they, you know, when, when the Union Carbide kills 20,000 people <laughs> at Bhopal out of greed, that, that's okay. That helps the bottom line. Again, the language are here. They're murdering it out of greed and vengeance. Again, Vengeance I'm just going to I'm going to say it again. These people started the Iraq war that killed about a million people. And guess what? <laughs> guess why they did it? Greed and, and vanity yeah. and vengeance yeah. as well. John Podhoretz, you guys know him, right? Yeah. You're familiar John. with John Podhoretz. Oh, yeah. One of the magazine's founders reports that they actively prevented prevent potential buyers from coming in to take over and keep it alive. They apparently wanted to hurt the employees and harvest the subscription list so they could make money off of it. Nah. And Ann Schultz, being a professing Christian, decided to close the magazine at the height of the Christmas season <laughs> and so cause maximum pain to his former employees and their families. What if it had been? Uh, wow. What if it had been a fucking uh, like uh, car factory? Okay. What if it had been a pl- like an auto plant? One of the last articles in the Weekly Standard, not last, but like very, very recent article in the Weekly Standard, written by Bill Crystal, the founder and editor in chief of the magazine, was basically about how the white working class needs to go and be replaced with a better class. Yeah. And that they should stop complaining about all their Rust Belt factory jobs yep. and manufacturing yep. and stop using their all their bitter hatred and resentment of other people yep. to, you know, to make themselves victims and complain about, you know, Ugh. dynamic global capitalism. Oh. And he basically just said, stop whining, move on, <laughs> get better skills, yeah. better yourselves in your life. And oh, oh. These like these, these hardworking guys who have um, literally had a make work job their entire life, where they got to fart out like mm, George W. Bush, the modern Pericles, <laughs> where they used a billionaire's money to literally pay other people to read their writing. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how these things functioned. Yeah, um, I do like the idea that they close on Christmas, so they're all gonna sleep. They're going to spend Christmas under a fucking overpass or something, <laughs> passing around a can of fucking baked beans. Well, Tiny Tim is never going to get that surgery. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I guess it's just back to the American Enterprise Institute for me. You know that they have like a fantasy, too, where like Anschluss is going to read this and be like. <laughs> his heart grew two sizes. Yeah. yeah his yeah. heart is shrunk that, two sizes that His heart day. shrunk two sizes or he was, he was visited by ghosts <laughs> and then he wakes up and he's like, what day is it today, boy? <laughs> And it's not too late, and he's going to open it back up. Why? Why, it's Operation Enduring Freedom Day, sir. 
get me the biggest, fattest Schnippers burger. Yes. <laughs> By the way, friend of the show, friend of the show, uh, friend of the show, Patty Mo, who I'm sure you know, uh, he, he sent us a picture today of the uh, the Schnippers uh, restaurant in the, in the New York Times building. New York Times building. Like half of the lights in the Schnippers sign are out. And he was just like very classy of them to be at half mass <laughs> for the Weekly Standard. <laughs> I'm sure J-Pod appreciated yeah. that. Um, so uh, the closing of the Weekly Standard is being told as a Trump story, as all stories must be these days. The magazine has been critical of Trump, and so this is another example of the gradual hegemony of, hegemony of Trumpism over the conservative world. That is indeed the backdrop to what happened here. But that's not the whole story. In reality, this is what happens when corporate drones take over an opinion magazine, try to drag it down to their oh, level. Oh, now you have a problem with yeah, drones. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, get ready. Try to drag it down to their level and then grow angry and resentful when the people at the magazine try to maintain some sense of intellectual standards. This is what happens when people with a populist mindset decide an un that an uneducated opinion is of the same value as an educated opinion, that ignorance sells better than learning. Again, their educated opinion being here being mostly that Saddam Hussein literally worked with Al Qaeda yeah. to plan and take pull off 9/11. Right. Who their one of their managing editors Stephen Hayes wrote an entire book about. Yeah. Right. That's their that's an educated opinion. Super educated. So damn educated. It uh, he goes I was on the staff I was on staff of when the Standard was founded. Bill Crystal, Pod Horitz and Fred Barnes. Yeah, think of those intellectual oh, titans oh, right there. Oh. They gathered the most concentrated collection of talent I have ever been around. <laughs> The first masthead featured Charles Krauthammer. Oh, damn. Dead. PJ O'Rourke. <laughs> dead. Robert Kagan. Dead. <laughs> David Frum. Dead. Chris Caldwell. Dead. Matt Labash. Wet. Tucker Carlson. <laughs> dry. And the greatest political writer of my generation, Andrew Ferguson. Probably pedophile. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. I'm, I don't know. I just made that. Not, not actionable. He's British, dude. Parody. He's, yeah, he's, he's British. He's British. He's a, he's a British Tory from the Oxbridge. Like, yeah, I, I allege it is perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. Early issues feature the writings of Tom Wolfe, dead, Gertrude Himmelfarb, mother of all tears, James Q. Wilson, Q, he is QAnon, and Harvey Mansfield. Harvey Mansfield. Yes. The, one of my favorite editions, and I little, and this is like, I think I, it's something I put in the book in second pass, and I'm so glad that I did. Harvey Mansfield is the literal professor of manliness at Harvard. <laughs> manliness. He teaches a class at Harvard on manliness. Yeah. Is and this like how there are a lot of like weather reporters with the name Storm? <laughs> <laughs> no, and he was Bill Crystal's professor at Harvard. And he is like the god neocon godfather. He teaches a class on manliness, and in a famous New York Times profile of him written by Deborah Solomon. She asked him, like, what personally, like, how he personally demonstrated his manly prowess. And he literally said, opening jars for my wife, who is very small, and moving furniture around our house, sometimes, but not regularly. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Damn, I think dude. that's mostly what we want. Is that, is that what women want? With, with I mean, man? like, in terms of manliness, it's like, oh, we can do most of the other stuff. Some of those jars are tight. To open, open the jars and move the credenza around <laughs> and hear the lamentations of your woman. No, well, to, I don't really need anything the, else. No, to open the jar and move the, move the couch <laughs> and then hear the adulations yeah. of the women because you are being very manly. Yeah. No, but in, in that, he basically demonstrated the lack of functional utility of masculinity in the modern age. It's like... Yeah, that's pretty much the only thing. We can do our taxes uh, and everything. And the yeah. other thing is do a Harvard class on manliness. Right. I Which is my, definitely I, not pussy yeah, shit. I learned my manliness in the streets, reading Maddox's alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the real street knowledge. Tucker right. Max. Right. Yeah. Maddox. Yes, that's where you get your real fun. Adam yeah. Carolla. Yeah. That's, that's dirty the, half court manliness. That's yeah. behind the back <laughs> passing manliness. That's will. That's what goodwill hunting manliness. You go. You take that street knowledge manliness, and then you go into the fancy Harvard bar and you shred those preppy manly guys. And he's like. He's like, you probably read Gordon Wood on masculinity. <laughs> I read what? Maddox. <laughs> it's when you get the Maddox, you'll realize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 the person at the bottom of the editorial masthead, a young uh, Nomi Rao, Rao, has just been nominated to replace Brett Kavanaugh on the U.S. <laughs> Court of Appeals. How many rapes has she done? I don't know. I'm just wondering. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was and remains a warm, fun, and convivial group. 
The magazine's tone was part high intellectualism, part street-level political reporting, and part Hunter Thompson-style gonzo journalism. Mm-hmm. I'm going to need that a was big old citation. Forget. That was when they had a little... Who too- can forget when Gertrude Himmelfarb did a whole bunch of ether and then shot a typewriter? <laughs> <laughs> no, like... You can remember when Jonah pr- Goldberg had one too many cigars on the National Review cruise. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're talking about when P.J. O'Rourke, yeah, he, he, went to, he went to Paris or something, and he just, like, made fun of the French while, while drinking a cognac or and something. And he kicked and a like, gypsy down at the metro <laughs> train stairs. <laughs> yes. They're like, damn, son. Uh, the standard was conservative, but frequently dissented from the Republican establishment and delighted in modern pop culture. The staff was never unanimous about Ugh. anything. The many flavors of conservatism were hashed out Ugh. on this page. The many flavors of conservatism <laughs> from uh, Unflavored shit, for me. From shit to vomit. Yeah. <laughs> And also, like, it's not like these people ha- had particularly, like, acerbic writing or anything. No, not at all. No, no it's yeah. like just bland horse. It's like the only things that ever stood out were when they would just, it would be ne- needle ner- needle-nosed, dorky, very pretentious prose. Like, I've read all the books prose. Yeah, and then but all of a sudden, they would mostly... just drop, and they would just be glassy-eyed psychopaths talking about the need for a resurgent a It was mostly like arsenic cream of wheat. It right. wasn't like, you know. But no, then they would stop and be like, yes, we must drown the world in, in blood to consecrate it. They'd start just chanting in a dead language. Over the past few years, if all the stories are correct, McKibben tried to change the tone of the magazine. He tried to get the standard to hire highly partisan shock jock streamers. He tried to tilt it more in the direction of a Republican direct mail fundraising letter. When these efforts were blocked, Resentment flared and the axe fell. So he tried to make it profitable. Right. Yeah. He tried to make it a going media concern in an era of, of, of polarization and uh, like a mass Republican. He behaves base. like a rational capitalist. Yes. Who, this, uh, he's a guy who sees the direction of the Republican uh, media class and what they want out of their media and, and tried to give it to them. So he tried to do capitalism. So that's what they're complaining The about. standard is now gone. But the people and ideas the standard nurtured will continue to flourish. Uh, the million or so Iraqis, they will continue to uh, nourish the ground <laughs> that they uh, now yes. occupy. Yes. Um, the depleted uranium left in Fallujah will be nourishing that part of the world for yep. probably the next 10,000 years. They're nourishing those white blood cells. Um, yeah. The talented young people who were fired this week will go on to have brilliant careers. Yeah, I'm sh- that's the thing. Yeah, Why they you, will. What are you crying about? These yeah. guys all have six-figure signatures at, at, at fucking think tanks or, or, or you know, like the fucking uh, reser- yeah. the, the federal court system. They're all getting ch- chambered into the shit tornado. and the, 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 the gr- They're all put back into the actual machinery of, of producing policy that's going to destroy everything. So Here, don't here's, worry here's the last that. line. Don't cry for them, Argentina. The courage- Where many uh, of the early writers for the Weekly Standard lived. Uh, after World War II. <laughs> <laughs> the courage and integrity Hayes has shown during the Trump era will continue to inspire while the drab corporate bureaucrats fade into the sand. <laughs> okay, so again, he began this like, we're using the language of murder in the name of greed and vengeance that they can't do their vanity fun newsletter every yeah. week. And then H- Stephen Hayes by being the respectable never Trump con- that's courage and integrity he's yeah. showing mm-hmm. while the drab corporate bureaucrats again I need to stress here the, what they're describing of what happened to them where some rich billionaire was just like fuck you I own you like I'm going to close you and fire all of you right before Christmas they're fine with those people running yes, every other again, aspect yeah. of capitalism yeah, in our economy yeah exactly they're not going he's they're not saying you know are there no prisons are there no workhouses yeah. they will literally be fine yeah. when this happens to people for whom there are actual repercussions to losing a job then they're like no hey, shit's that's the thing when when joe ricketts literally did the same thing to DNA Info and Gothamist, which actually were worthwhile local media operations. And DNA Info, in my opinion, did, did a lot of really great they did local, stuff on housing. local yeah. news reporting at a time when like actual print local news yeah. journalism is withering away yeah. entirely. Uh, when those people literally got, not only that, but had their archives deleted, all yeah. their clips. Yeah, so their clips. And were, yeah. Yeah, their That's clips deleted and were given a box and just shoved out that the That was just punitive. Door. John Podhoritz was literally chortling and the, his flesh was just rippling <laughs> as he laughed and chortled at these dumb young people yeah. who, you know, were stupid enough stupid, to try to yeah. find or organize a union. Yeah, like, what do you think was oh, going to happen, yeah, You get what you deserve. Yeah. And yeah, no, and now and now he's pretending that what happened, the exact same thing happened to him is like I have been murdered. 
I have been murdered, sir. Wow. It Who really will is. stand for the victims of the weekly standard? But again, uh, they're literally letting healthcare, housing, education, everything run at the whim of insane billionaires. Yeah. They're fine with. This is the perfect example of capitalism for thee, not me. Well, that's, because what that's, they yeah. think is that the ideas mm. and there's mm -hmm. they, they and they always say of course the weekly standard make made money but what they keep saying over and over is like the ideas and the intellectual dialogue <laughs> the modern agora that we represent is more important than money yeah no well, it fucking is not nothing is more nothing important is than more money that's yeah. what capitalism yeah. is it's where the, there's one determiner of value and it's money and that's how it solves all your. You pressure. had a you don't great to, run of it. Yeah. You don't have to worry about everyone coming together and and and, and, and demagoguery of the, yeah. like oh populism taking over and, and and warping the market. You just let the market decide. You had a great run of it. Look, you had a great gap year. Yeah, exactly. Now it's time to get a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've been insulated from having your work be sub subject to the standards of a market economy. Yeah. In that, like, you've been underwritten. Or a moral or economy. A mor yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've been exempt from both of those standards. Yeah. But guess what? All of them will be fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And guess and what? And they did the war, the war in Iraq. And they got Spy the war in Iraq. magazine, all they ever did was give uh, Trump a p complex about his hands. That's it. These fucking guys killed a million people. And I guarantee you this, because of all this weeping now, I saw fucking Jake Tapper being like, um, think of the journalists who like are out of work this week and I'm like I'm sorry like I am like Scrooge for these people put them in the fucking debtors prison yeah none of these people are talented none of them have done anything good for humanity by no. like writing an article about like what Plato would think about Donald Rumsfeld they're or all something. legacy fucking cases too they're all just like mm -hmm. Podoritz and, 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 and Goldberg and Crystal they're all somebody's nephew or somebody's kid just slotted in there just just frictionlessly slotted in from the school that they didn't deserve to get into right into these jobs in these fucking Harvey Mansfield magazines. Bill Crystal into Harvard, yeah, by the way. Right. Um, as a favor to Irving. As a favor to Irving Crystal, um, who then told him he thought affirmative action undermined the meritocracy. <laughs> yeah. Very fun. Also a classic anecdote about these people. But um, here, I, I want to read a, another piece. This is from uh, John Schwartz writing in The Intercept this week. Uh, John Schwartz is like, one of my favorite actual like OG bloggers. Oh yeah, he was one good. of the few. He's one of the few who you and I read yeah. who is not an insane DNC Russia yeah. idiot now. Uh, Tiny Revolution was his blog. I was a huge fan of him, but he's yeah. he's still spitting that fire, and his hate is still pure. And he came out with the article. I was fucking hoping someone would do. I tried to do a little of it when I read you like uh, the, some of their Iraq War articles the other week, but he came out this week with. The 10 most appalling articles in the Weekly Standard's short and dreadful life. Oh, I love a listicle. And he, no, but he, this is a great, most famous, I just want to read this. Most famous for making the case for the catastrophic invasion of Iraq. The magazine was born just one year before Murdoch created Fox News. Both outlets were extremely effective at achieving the same goals via different tactics. Fox was chum for the rubes. The Weekly Standard was chum for Ivy League rubes. Fox pushed mindless belligerence, conspiracism, and a deep hatred for reality. The Weekly Standard did the same thing, but with less cleavage and more quotes from Cicero. <laughs> and that so perfectly sums up who these people are and what their magazine is for. And I'm sorry, like, before we get into this, like, all oh, the people who are out of work now, I'm 1,000% convinced that because of this and because now that, like, they have literally are now gladly wrapping themselves in the cloak and mantle of victimhood. It's going to work, and the Democratic Party <laughs> is going to be the next organ to which the neoconservative parasite hive mind oh, yeah. brain bug attaches. It just sticks the thing in yep. the top and sucks the, the brain The return down. of Scoop Jackson. Yep. That's happening. And they're going to have, you know, there's going to be a muscular foreign yep. policy in the Beto Biden administration. Yep, yep. Let me tell you that. Yep. So I want to go through now. I'm not going to read all of them, but I want to go through the top 10 worst Weekly Standards article with big props to John Schwartz for putting this together. Uh, the first one is called The Collapse of the Dream Palaces by David Brooks in 2003. Okay, he Hannibal goes, Lecter, Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. From the Weekly Standards April 28, 2003 issue, that is a month after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, this may simultaneously be the worst, funniest, and most terrifying writing ever published in the English language. For instance, its opening paragraph includes, includes the phrase, now that the war in Iraq is over, <laughs> you may read it. You must read it for yourself. It cannot be explained, only experienced. 
What you may find is that it makes you feel as though a sweaty middle-aged man is pointing a gun at you and fervently explaining that people like you who wear red shirts are human scum and you, all of you, are about to get what's coming to you at last. Then you look down and notice you are not wearing a red shirt, but the man with the gun is. <laughs> when you finish reading the piece, remember that this was published just five months before the New York Times hired Brooks as an op-ed writer. In other words, the, sci the Times saw this gibbering so disconnected from reality and it's functionally insane and thought... This is exactly who we want explaining the world to our readers. Parenthetically, it must be emphasized that Bill Crystal also had a New York Times opinion column. Very, very briefly. And they canned him for being too boring and lazy and bad at writing. They've kept Brooks for what is it now? Uh, Forever. For, yeah. It's almost 20 well, years over now. Over 10 years, over but, a decade. But br they had to can Bill. That's how bad he was at this job. The guy who founded this fucking magazine that's supposed to be the, the, the modern partisan review. Uh, the next is What to Do About Iraq by Robert Kagan and Bill Crystal. The Iraqi threat is enormous, Robert Kagan and Crystal <laughs> wrote about girthy, the beginning. It is low key <laughs> thick. At the beginning It'll of, bust your back walls. At the beginning of 2002, it gets bigger with every day that <laughs> That's passes. That's so big. Damn. We hear from many corners <laughs> that You could not fit this thread around in your mouth. <laughs> Never. You'd choke. You'd gag on it. He goes, If too many months go by without a decision to move against Saddam, the risks to the United States may increase exponentially. Grow Say and grow and grow <laughs> and grow and grow. Say what you will with your 2020 sign set. This is John now. Uh, but you can't deny they totally called this. We know that Mohammed Atta, the ringleader of September 11th, went out of his way to meet with an Iraqi intelligence official a few months before he flew a plane into the World Trade Center. I mean... There is no debate about the facts. That's actually true. There is no debate anymore. <laughs> that's, that's the like next no, is, one is, no um, one will make that argument anymore. Case Closed by Stephen Hayes, 2004. Hayes spent years trying to prove the case that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden were collaborators. Case Closed is a perfect example of his work in that Hayes successfully demonstrates two things. First, Iraq had fewer ties to al-Qaeda than any other Gulf state. And second, he is the world's most gullible human being. Here, Hayes faithfully scribbled down the, uh, the pensees of J Douglas J. Fife, then Under Secretary of Defense, and known at the Pentagon as the fucking stupidest guy on the face of the earth. Uh, the next one, The Bumpy Road to Democracy in Iraq by Fred Barnes, 2004. Operation Those Iraqi bumps their bodies. <laughs> Operation Iraqi Freedom has gained impressive momentum. Barnes warned us that when we ventured into Baghdad a year after the Iraq War began, but like so many of history's pith-helmeted white people, Barnes was concerned with the recalcitrance of the dusky natives. Iraqis, wrote Barnes, need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> Iraqis are difficult to deal with. They're sullen and suspicious and conspiracy-minded. <laughs> Papers obsess on the subject of the brutal treatment of innocent Iraqis by American soldiers. But Barnes knew Iraqis were being treated well by U.S. troops because the troops were super nice to him. Barnes concluded by saying that he wanted to see Iraqis demonstrate an outbreak of gratitude for the greatest <laughs> act of benevolence one country has ever done for another. Ooh. Ooh. Number five, Breaking the Climate Spell by Rupert Darrell in 2017. <laughs> uh, this is just pretty 2017, standard. 2017, they're still saying, yeah, it's no big deal. Uh, the next one is Campus Disruptor by Naomi Schaefer oh, Riley. Oh. Don't even care about yeah, that Yeah, that's one. the only thing that they actually cared about beyond Endless War was the campus bullshit, which uh, here's a good one. always a sign because of somebody with their finger on... Because they're perpetually on gap year. Yeah, <laughs> their finger firmly on the pulse of their asshole. Here's another good one. Number seven, are Syria's chemical weapons Iraq's missing WMD? Obama's director of intelligence thought, though, by Mark Hemingway. <laughs> Mr. Molly Hemingway. <laughs> Mark Hemingway notes that in 2003, James Clapper, who later became director of national intelligence under Barack Obama, bloviated about how we weren't finding any chemical weapons in Iraq because they'd probably been moved to Syria. But Iraq wouldn't have had any incentive to do this. Even if they'd been hiding chemical weapons, they're easy to make, and it would have been far simpler just to dump them than manufacture more when the cost was clear, coast was clear. Then Hemingway learnedly explained that while it was largely downplayed by the media, American troops in Iraq also stumbled across caches of chemical weapons. Doesn't this suggest that Bush was right and some of them might have ended up in Syria? No. I mean, what they meant is that they found mustard gas, like yeah, decaying like old, mustard gas old shells. the decroated uh, containers of it from, from the Iraq War or from the Gulf War, which is Here when, is genuinely the most insane still, one. Because they, they never manufactured it. After. Here is the most insane one. The Worst Thing About Gay Marriage by Sam Shulman, 2009. <laughs> 
<laughs> not going to explicate the further connections to Sam Shulman, but uh, I'm certain certain fans, quote unquote, of the show might be able to show you those connections on a large cork board with. Uh, it's not me with though. Ni- with, with, uh, it's not me and my family. That's all. No, of for that's, once, it's not all. you. Okay. This, is, this one is actually the most insane one, and this one uh, actually cuts against the idea that the Weekly Standard was just concerned with like foreign policy and you know, antiquity. National greatness. Na- okay. Here, Sam Shulman first expresses amazement at the rapidity with, with which gays have gained their, attained the right to hold jobs, even as teachers and members of clergy, and explain, all these rights have made gays not just free, but our neighbors. <laughs> Also, the only <laughs> real reason for marriage is protecting and controlling the sexuality of the childbearing sex. Then Shulman frets that gay marriage will obviously lead to brothers marrying brothers mm-hmm. and fathers marrying sons. Of course. But on the other hand, he's concerned that unmarried gay sex won't face greater social sanction than married gay sex and plaintively asks, but without social disapproval of unmarried sex, what kind of madman would seek marriage? <laughs> the upshot Am is, I right, guys? The upshot is that after the initial excitement of <laughs> gay incest marriage, all the gay <laughs> Americans will realize marriage is pointless and will stop getting married. You know, these people always tell on themselves, like, we know where your head is at. You are projecting your incest fantasy on the entire yeah. world. Weekly Standard, a magazine about getting gay with your dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, how could you not say that and immediately think, oh, what, is that just me? Well, I like it. He was like, well, at the height of the gay marriage debate, that was every week some psycho would come out and just blurt out their own weird fetish. Like when Santorum is talking about people fucking dogs and turtles and stuff. Like, why did your mind go there immediately? One of my favorite Saw moments. Turtle, one just, of my favorite you know. moments uh, back in the gay marriage debate, the person who made this exact um, argument about fathers marrying <laughs> their sons was um, Jeremy Irons, who oh, went yeah. on oh, briefly lived Huffington yeah. Post Live, which was their sort of like, it was like a streaming day- daytime news show, and they would like interview people, and sometimes they got some pretty interesting guests, and Jeremy Irons was on one time. Jeremy Irons, wonderful actor, one of my favorite actors, already one of the so creepiest insane. people. So insane, One yeah. of the creepiest people alive. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you could, he's not just playing. Yeah. Those in characters. Dead Ringers, it's like, yeah. 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 The mental twins or fucking uh, Klaus von Bülow. Klaus von Bülow, like, or the head Morlock from the time machine. <laughs> yeah, Simon yeah, yeah. from Die Hard. Yeah. Uh, they, they brought up the topic of gay marriage with uh, Jeremy Irons. And uh, he just said, Jeremy's. <laughs> he just said, very interesting, very fascinating to me. Obviously, you know, I'm in favor of love. Love everyone. Everyone thinks you should be able to be loved. I love my dog. He literally said, you know, I love my dog the same way I think, you know, a gay person would uh, <laughs> love their spouse. And then he said, it, it, is, it is interesting, though, you know, from a tax perspective. Could a father not marry his son and not pay, um, you know, inheritance tax? <laughs> and, like, the question, the answer to that is... Um, it's currently illegal for a father to marry his daughter right. to avoid yeah. Yeah. Uh, t- tax liability. <laughs> yeah. So why well, no, 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 no. He's English, so it's not. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. I'm... There's another. There's one. I just want to skip it. The number ten of the uh, most abominable Weekly Standard articles: "Going Soft on Iran" by Rule mm. Mar- Mark mm-hmm. Garrett, 2004. Mm. Okay. The Weekly Standard quickly became the most strident voice for neoconservatism in the U.S., and as we know, there's nothing neoconservatives care more about than democracy. In this article, former CIA case officer Rule Mark Garrett writes of his yearning for Iranians to experience it. If you want to read more about how much the Weekly Standard supports democracy in Iran, well, there's a lot for you there. Some people ask why the neoconservatives who care so much about democracy in Iran don't seem to get upset about attacks on democracy here in America, things that they could seemingly do something about, like voter suppression, or why the Bush administration's neoconservatives tried to stage a coup to overturn the, overturn the results of a democratic Palestinian election, or why the neoconservatives in the Reagan administration supported death squads in Central America, or why the proto-neoconservatives in the 1950s cared so much about democracy in China, yet didn't care at all about the civil rights movement in the U.S. Ignore these cynics. The evidence they cite about the actions of, ne- of the neoconservatives. The Weekly Standard expressed their love of democracy, not with boring old actions, but what, with what truly matters, words. That settles that. So, yeah. Uh, I just want to say, uh, uh, last week there was an event in, in New York. I don't know where, unfortunately. 
because uh, I'd like to say send a bouquet to the, the wait staff of whatever establishment this was. But on the 15th of December, uh, according to one former writer for the Weekly Standard, tonight, Standard staffers from every moment in its 23-year existence gathered for a wake slash shiva. The bonhomie was irrepressible. We knew we had been a part of something spectacular and important, and it taken the kind of pride in it <laughs> unknown to the untalented suits who did it in. That was, of course, John Pedoritz. And I imagine that whatever this Bacchanal was, that the poor waiters had to chew up the burgers and just drop them into their waiting maws like baby birds because they were too busy having irrepressible bonhomie to chew. Well, also, when you're that inbred, your teeth just fall out. Yeah. I will say that that this is indicative of a number of things, the death of the Weekly Center. And obviously one of them is just the way that populist wing has sort of over, overwhelmed the intellectual wing and then made it redundant. And it is also reflective of something that Alex Breen has talked about, which is the way that, that, the, that the media that was originally designed to speak to the rubes of the Republican Party, the Fox News conspiratorial hysteric register, was always meant for the, the, the Morlocks and not for the Eloy of the conservative movement. Over time, they basically poisoned their own well, media-wise, and enough of these guys, they got older, and they started watching it, and they started taking it seriously. And so now, there isn't really a lot of intellectual difference between the billionaire class of, of Republican elites and the people that they're trying to uh, stir up with, with stuff like Fox News. The billionaires think now the same kind of conspiracy shit as the, the, the idiots were supposed to. And so they don't need an intellectual patina anymore. They don't need this self-congratulatory little newsletter that they can all put on their coffee tables and feel smug about. They're all in on the whole suite of, of just dipshit rubbery that was originally just supposed to be instrumental and, 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 and move votes and not actually affect the opinions of the, of the people in charge. And but now they really believe it. I was talking it. about network last night, and it's as if, like... At this point, like Howard Beale's kind of, you know, demagogue character has lost any kind of everyone's like everyone has listened, has heard what Ned Beatty said. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, there's only profit. Yeah. So this idea that um, there are these ideological battles that are that the world runs on ideological battles and not battles of power and capital and politics. Um, I don't think I, I think that that time has kind of passed. Like that's washing away. Well, I just mean that if you read interviews with a lot of these billionaires. Like Sheldon Adelson. Billionaire mm -hmm. people. And they believe the same Sheldon Adelson's shit, brain is as idiots. rotten yeah. as like anyone who watches Fox right. News eight, exactly. 10 hours Like they believe the same shit about, oh, the Democrats, they've got Sharia, they're going to do Sharia law. Like they think that way. I'd like to share now, um, remember when uh, David Brooks said like uh, the Weekly Standard, you know, delighted in pop culture and, you know, po you know, things that are, you know, movies and things like that. I'd like to check in with Treat Ogre, John Podhoritz, <laughs> in a column. This is his last column for the Weekly Standard called A Valediction. And this is about his career as a movie reviewer or movie critic. That, you know, a okay, I just want to just show you and Amber the actual picture that they chose to illustrate this article. <gasps> <laughs> the most accurate representation of Podhoritz I've ever seen as just a giant baby Huey yeah. with a dumb grin stuffing popcorn in his giant maw. They didn't but have like, to like show him Like how a baby does. Like how a baby has to use two fingers because yeah, like, they only adapt the pincer yeah, movement they first. They don't have full motor control yeah. yet. I just want to read uh, some, some of this. And like this is ostensibly a column about you know movies that stand the test of time and what does and what doesn't. And I was like, I'm gonna just. This is like, this is the level of taste that they're operating at at the high conservative magazine. The question I've been asked the most across the decades besides what's your favorite movie to which the only correct answer is The Godfather. And that goes for you too and everyone else alive because if you answer differently, you're wrong. And no, The Godfather 2 isn't better. Shame on you. The question is, why are movies so liberal and how can you stand it? Okay. To say that The Godfather is the best movie of all time is the most basic fucking answer you could possibly that's give. A, that's level. an epic bacon like, response. I'm not, like, yeah. The Godfather is a good movie. Yeah, it's, really, it's good. It's fine. I think Goodfellas it, it, is better. Oh, Goodfellas uh, is a million times yeah. better than The Godfather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Godfather 1 and 2. Yeah. Wait, I got, I got to take another digression. Uh, Jennifer Albright found this for me from a, a Baffler article. 
I forget the Baffler article, but this is about Murray Rothbard. Oh, God. Murray, uh, Murray Rothbard loved The Godfather, too. In a 1990 pan of Goodfellas, he celebrated Coppola's films as opposed to Scorsese. While The Godfather films depicted, quote, an epic world, a world of drama and struggle, Rothbard complained that Scorsese portrayed the mafia as sordid. The violence <laughs> is random. The-, <laughs> the violence is random, gratuitous, pointless, and psychotic. Everyone from the protagonist Henry Hill, and he misspells Ray Liotta's name as Ray Liotta, is a de- is on is a boring creep. Rothbard even thought that The Godfather repl- reflected his own worldview. Organized crime is essentially a narco capitalist, a productive industry struggling to govern itself. <laughs> Eventually, he forgot also that he also called the state his great en- enemy, a criminal band. So he didn't like Goodfellas because it showed the people that personate, populate the mafia as um, gratuitous, sleazy psychos who- whose entire right. premise of being honorable they'll drop at the, at, they'll drop <laughs> yeah. instantly if they become in, threatened in any way. And we'll just murder everyone and don't give a shit. I mean, and bad things pass. happen in The Godfather, but it is a romanticized view. Yeah, of which the is Italian why that's mafia. when all the actual mob guys decided to base their bullshit on because it was so flattering and it gave them this self perception. There's we are order. Men. There's a code. Yeah, and then yeah. they all just kill each other and fucking ratted each other out nonstop. No, but like for to a, for a film critic to say The Godfather is the best movie ever made is the most basic opinion you could, you could not have possibly a more. have. You could not you could not produce a, an opinion that would make me less interested in your pungent film criticism than that. But the question of most people ask him is, why are movies so liberal and how can you stand it? The answer to how, how can you stand it is that I, I stand, stand it just fine. Yeah. Always. Yeah. <laughs> I never, it hurts. It hurts my ankles. I stand it just fine so long as it's not rubbed in my face. Ooh. No, the, the, that the treats are what I rub. <laughs> the chocolate is what I rub on my face, not politics. Oddly enough, that's pretty much the same Hollywood, the same answer Hollywood gets at the box office. Its most nakedly political offerings have done pretty badly in the decades I've been writing. The most left-wing movie ever to win an Oscar for Best Picture is probably Platoon, which is supposedly a serious examination of an American crime against humanity during the Vietnam War, but is actually an extended Oliver Stone psychotic fantasy about murdering his platoon's lieutenant. I mean, again, Vietnam was a war crime. It was yeah. bad news, people. So whatever. Shouldn't have done Vietnam. Whatever, home. wavy gravy. Most other efforts <laughs> at direct conservative bashing end up on the trash heap of cinematic history. Scooter Libby has good reason to dance on the grave of Fair Game, the film that sought to lionize Valerie, Valerie Plame and earned a whopping $9 million at the domestic box <laughs> Oh, office. God, dude. I don't know how anyone has not noticed this, and I stupidly forgot to point this out. Netflix currently has a director's cut of Fair Game that what? they re-released for 2018. That is on Netflix now. What is in it that wasn't in it? I don't know. I didn't see the first time, and, and I, so I wouldn't be able to compare it. But I, I, it's because they're trying to capitalize on the Mueller shit. And as we all know, Valerie Plame was the first Mueller thing. Patrick Fitzgerald and his investigation, that was originally, that's the first Mueller thing. That was the thing that was going to stop Bush. That wasn't Robert Mueller himself. No, but it was the same premise. Okay. A federal prosecutor was going to stop the bad, oh, yeah. the bad Republicans because of what they'd done to Valerie Plame. And that movie is about that. And they fucking re-release like, a version with, I guess, extra footage that's on Netflix now. It says, uh, fair game, the 2018 version. So mm. they're they're trying to get the resistance people to get all wild, whipped up again at the prospect. But they of, have no memory. That well, that's, won't work. That's what's so funny. They don't have any memory, and if they watch it, they'd be like, "What happened with this?" Oh, right, nobody got in trouble. Yeah. And the guy who did get indicted got uh got fucking pardoned. I expressed a great many opinions in this magazine over the past twenty three years, <laughs> yeah. and looking no, back on know. them, I'm reminded of the fact that if you judge a movie critic by the accuracy of his opinions, you're never going to like any movie critic ever. There are views I can't even believe. Accuracy of opinions is a contradiction in terms. Yeah. uh, My opinions are, an opinion can't be accurate. Accurate, yeah. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. He goes on to say that in 1996, I wrote Mr. Hollum's Opus was the only movie we'd remember from that year. (laughs) I mean, I just wanted to let you know that The Godfather is, in his opinion, the greatest movie ever made. Yeah. Which just goes to show that he has the brain of a child. Yeah. It's not just that either. It's like, what adult man says, okay, what's the greatest movie ever made? Like, what sophisticated, no, ex- like, yeah. cinephile sits there and ranks things in that way? No, that, yeah, like, who is the king movie? Talking about who best won movies the movie? Ever is childish yeah. shit anyway. That's, yeah, there, there is no 
best movie. Yeah. There's no like, best movie. I, I don't even have a favorite movie. And I don't him, either. And, and not only say that, but make it like some sort of litmus test. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, it's not That's, only do I say it's the best movie, it's objectively the best movie. And he's trying disagree. to be cheeky, yeah. but it's like well, he's utterly childish. <laughs> yeah, well, he's covered in cheeks. He's mostly cheek. <laughs> It's it's just like utterly childish. Like I don't know anyone who has that's like that's like having a favorite color as an adult man. <laughs> <laughs> anyone who says anything other than green is clearly wrong. I actually did see Fair Game and it sucked. <laughs> well you should watch the new one yeah, and yeah. tell me what's in it. Well, is, are there like are they just are there do they ADR in references to Trump in the background yeah. <laughs> just to give people like goose them and remind them this relates to now? But again, like Scooter Libby actually did do that shit. And again, no, they never proved it. Oh, right. He went to see this is what it's amazing. This is the cycle. It's the flat circle of time. And now people have no memory. Everyone who's so excited about the Miller investigation. All of the most of this shit is about people obstructing justice and lying to the interviewers. That is what they got Libby, Libby for. And they charged him with it because they couldn't get any evidence that it was Rove because nobody would turn on him. And so all they got was Libby for for basically, I guess, lying to them or refusing to tell them the truth, and then he got... See, I told you my evolution on that was like, you know, we discussed before, I was obsessed with the, you know, flame investigation when yeah, it was the too. Bush, because I was, was like, oh my God, it. they outed a CIA agent. But I guess it's a sign that I've matured, because now I'm like, actually, it's good that they outed a CIA agent. <laughs> wow. And all CIA agents should be outed. I Give me that knock list. People pointed out, like, what would you... Have, all, these all those people were mad in, in uh, the Bush years about that. What would you have thought of Philip Agee when he put all the names out on the street in the 70s. I mean, and then went to Cuba, you know? I mean, was he a hero or is, is he basically just Carl, doing Carl Rove's bidding because I guess, what, Jimmy Carter was president or something? Well, uh, that's the weekly standard, folks. Uh, may it rot in hell forever. Tamp, tamp the dirt down, yeah. as Elvis Costello said. Uh, one last thing today. I'd just like to close with this. In the Washington Post, the perspectives, the post-everything section, May have reached the nadir of uh, writing entire articles about Trump voters and how they <laughs> feel about the president. This may be. I may, hope we'll get them all. Every one. Yeah, of them. literally every, every single, single person who votes for Trump will have an article yeah. written about them and yeah. like how they. How do you feel about all yeah. it, man? You know, this may be my favorite headline of the year, or one of them, even as we close out the year. I voted for Trump. Now his wall may destroy my butterfly paradise. <laughs> The Republican Party is... You know what? You could, have, you could have seen some of this coming. Like, oh, you, you think he's going to resurrect manufacturing? He's probably not going to do that. You're, you're probably being, uh, you know, snowed on that. Maybe you could even argue, hey, the, the, the farmers, if he's serious about this trade stuff, there could be tariffs and it could bite you in the ass. You could maybe argue it. I don't think anybody was going to see this coming, though, that voting for Trump would own their... Their precious butterfly sanctuary. It says the Republican Party is abandoning the conservative principles I treasured. <laughs> what? <laughs> Preserving like monarch butterfly habitats? They what love conservatism? That shit. Wow. Like, they would fucking put an oil derrick through a fucking, you know, the last white rhino's head. Once again, thought, these mm. people do not remember the 90s when the number spotted one owl. enemy, the number one right, enemy right, right, of right, the right. Republican Party was the spotted they owl. Hated More that than any owl. human being. It was that goddamn owl. They would have fucking shot him in the head. <laughs> At the RNC, just ha have fucking Limbaugh. Bob Dole come out I remember with, a, with a fucking Tommy gun and just machine gun an entire uh, cage full of spotted owls. I remember Rush Limbaugh would have uh, barbecues where he'd have spotted owl burgers. Yep. Yep. I mean, not for real, right. but, you know. So this guy, this is, his name is uh, Luciano uh, Guerra. Hey, Mr. Trump, what are you doing? Uh, you keep up my butterflies. <laughs> Right now in Mission, Texas, we don't worry about immigrants. Who we don't so worry about the immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's taking away my butterflies. Papa, <laughs> uh, He says, right now in Mission, Texas, we don't worry about immigrants who cross the border illegally or drug smugglers. We worry about having to defend our private property from seizure by the federal government. I work at the National Butterfly Center, a fucking... Overpaid government job. <laughs> Who is this guy? He's using my tax dollars <laughs> to fucking look at catch butterflies yeah, all day. Literally. How do you like that? The, the, uh, I'm using, I need your cash he's using to just my, look at some butterflies. They're using legalized theft, a.k.a. income Taxation, tax. Taxation, yes. To fund a national butterfly center. Folks, you think the, I think the butterflies would be fine without uh, 
pencil yeah. neck government scientists yeah. studying them. They've been around for thousands of years before the U.S. government came along. Actually, they're all dying out, along with many other insects <laughs> that support all life on the planet Earth. It's okay. We don't need to talk or think about that now or ever. But he said, documenting wildlife and leading educational tours for the National Butterfly Center. He's a, he's a, not, he's a teacher. He's a government teacher. Oh and my bureaucrat. god! And not even of like STEM or something people could use. <laughs> no. Just come look at these butterflies. He's Aren't a butterfly they pretty? teacher. He's Professor Butterfly. He's a he's a, he's a professor. He's of the feelings. monarch. This is the monarch. <laughs> he's a professor of feelings. Many of our visitors are young students from the Rio Grande Valley. When they first arrive. Some of the children are scared of everything, from the snakes to the pill bugs. Here, we can show them animals that roam free and teach them not to be afraid. Teach them not to be afraid of butterflies? <laughs> Who are these weak ass? They're yeah. teaching lib children they not are. to be afraid of butterflies. They're teaching them to get fucking safe space <laughs> from butterflies. These kids need to toughen up. They should run them through a fucking uh, obstacle course or something. Drop them in a pit with snakes or something. Mm -hmm. And instead of being like, don't worry, we'll hug you as the butterfly. We talk about how they should do a, the, they should do the boo box from uh, from Hook, and that will teach them yeah. that they are that insects are to be embraced. We talk about how we planted native vines, shrubs, and trees to attract some 240 species of butterflies, as well as dragonflies, grasshoppers, and other insects. The bugs brought the birds, including some you can't see anywhere else in America, like green jay, green jays and the chalacas. This motherfucker's like Jonathan Franzen. He's a birder. <laughs> and from there, bobcats and coyotes. We want to teach these kids what it takes to create a home for all kinds of animals. How did this guy end up as a Trump supporter? <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah. The he said something about seizure of property. Yeah. Like there's federal. You know, well, because they're going to run. I believe what it is, is yeah. they're going to run the wall through there. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. the idea. President Trump's new border wall, which he has threatened to shut down the government to fund, will teach them what it takes to destroy it. The first section funded by Congress in 2018 for construction starting early next year will cut right through our 100-acre refuge, Oops. sealing off 70 acres bordering the banks of the Rio Grande. The plan that we've seen calls for 18 feet of concrete and 18 feet of steel bollards with a 150-foot paved enforcement zone for cameras, sensors, lighting, and border patrol traffic on the south side of the barrier. Flooding will worsen. On the north side, animals, including threatened species like the Texas tortoise and Texas horned lizard, will be cut off from ranging beyond, ranging beyond the wall for feeding and breeding. You know what I say to the Texas horned lizard? Get a job. <laughs> Provide some fucking value for your existence or else tough shit. And he goes on to talk about all the other wonderful wildlife well, refuges no, that are being threatened by... Yeah, uh, well, here's the value add. He says uh, ecotourism brings 436 million a year to our economy and supports more than 6,600 no 6,600 jobs. I'm a lifelong Republican who voted for Donald Trump for president <laughs> in 2016. Okay, I dude. want our immigration yeah. laws to be enforced, and I don't want open borders. But Mission is not a dangerous place. I've lived here my, all my life. Here at the National Butterfly Center, 6,000 school children visit every year. Girl Scouts come here when they camp overnight just a mile or so from the Rio Grande. Well, you know, put that wall there or else they'll be fucking raped and murdered yeah. by the caravan. Exactly. Okay? Buddy, are you more care you do you care more about these butterflies than you do about Girl Scouts? Apparently he does. Sick Apparently he does. Pretty sick. Oh. Sick Pretty sick. Disgusting. He really likes the butterflies. Ugh. Before this controversy, I voted and sometimes expressed my political views on Facebook, <laughs> but this issue got me involved in activism for the first time. Butterfly activism. <laughs> I had never gone to a protest in my entire life, but last year I helped organize one, a four-mile march to the La Lomita Chapel, a historic church on U.S. soil that the wall will block. I also joined a group that succeeded in lobbying the Mission City Council to pass an anti-wall resolution. People have asked me, didn't you listen to Trump when he said that he would build a wall? This is a good question. I didn't take the idea seriously during ah. the campaign. I knew he couldn't get Mexico to pay for it. That'd be like asking Hurricane Harvey to foot the bill for rebuilding Houston. And I thought it was just talk. Another candidate making big promises he couldn't keep. I never thought it would actually happen. Oh, by boy. backing the wall. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my the one thing that was the cornerstone of his entire campaign he pursued? Oh, no. Oh, no, my butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> By backing the wall, my party has abandoned the conservative principles I treasure. Less government, less spending, and respect for the law and private property. And then he just goes on to talk about how much it's going to cost to build the wall. Still, I want to be able to tell my grandchildren and great-grandchildren that I fought against the wall. 
I worry that if it goes up, they're only experience. All of his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are just butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> I fear that their only experience of the Rio Grande Valley's natural beauty will be through the photographs that I take today. If Donald Trump runs for a second term, he will not get my vote. Well, there we go. We found the one person. Donald He's lost switch. the butterfly voters. He lost voters. the butterfly man. He's if just... only everyone could meet one butterfly, they would stop <laughs> voting for Donald Trump. He's like, I worry that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren will have to form their chrysalis elsewhere <laughs> and seek pollen in uh, <laughs> countries with, uh, without, without walls. Yeah, countries without walls. Visualize a country without walls. Visualize a country throbbing with chrysalis. That's that's why I visualize you watching Saturday Night Live <laughs> yeah. every week. You, you just, look, you, you guys you are were all... witness to a great becoming. Exactly. <laughs> You're ants in the afterbirth. And again, like it's just someone murdered the Weekly Standard. Can you believe it, folks? They just straight up murdered. They just murked that shit. They they just broad daylight just walked up to it. They popped Ta- pop they pop point right in, in his the brain. Of the yeah. they, they pop weekly standard in the vacants. Who will mourn for the weekly standard? Who will get justice for the weekly standard? Who that, today speaks of the weekly standard? Hopefully, no one in a year will ever speak of it. Yeah, hopefully, it will be lost in the sands Look, of time and I, content. I don't want to get in trouble for this. I'm just the weekly standard was murdered. I'm just hoping literally all of its editors and writers pass on from natural causes as well. Yes. That's all I'm saying. Just keep going to schnippers, guys. I'm telling you, it's all going to be prostate cancer. Even the women, somehow. <laughs> somehow. All two of the women. The first ever case yeah. of female prostate cancer. Yeah, Gertrude Himmelfarb is a good candidate for that. Well, folks, uh, until next time, we'll talk to you again soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye.